we would we would um as we grab our elements let us look at the book of mark 14 22 through 25 i'm gonna put on my screen Mark 14, 22 through 25. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take it for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. I tell you the truth. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Let us just lift our bread and our wine and pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your body, oh God, and blood, oh God, for this bread that represents your body and the cup of wine that represents your blood, which was sacrificed, oh God, which you sacrificed through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, Heavenly Father, we recognize even as we partake, oh God, we partake with this understanding, oh God, we partake with this very understanding that for as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this wine, drink this wine, we continue to proclaim your name until you come again. Yeah. Father, we pray this morning, oh God, that as we partake of your body and blood of Jesus Christ, oh God, every every iota of sickness, whatever it is, whatever mm -hmm. substance that's in this body, oh God, will be cleansed and flushed out in the name of Jesus. Because yes. you made our body, even before we were born, oh God, you knew us for you formed us all the way before we even came through our mother's womb, oh God. So you know every body part of our bodies, oh God. From our toes all the way to our hair, oh God. Whatever it is, oh God, that in our bodies that's not supposed to be there, the blood of Jesus is flushing it out yes, in the name yes. of Jesus. Let yes, us Lord. break the bread and eat, and then we drink as well with this understanding. Please, Amen. love, drink with this understanding. Whatever it is in your system, trust that the blood of Jesus is cleansing it out. It's flushing it out. Any substance, mm -hmm. it's going Amen. out. Amen. Believe it. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Amen. Amen. All right. I suppose um, we are ready for the word. So we want to say thank you to everyone who is fellowshipping with us at this time. Amen. Amen. We thank God for another day that he has brought us together. So that we just commit our lives into your hands and care. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would speak to us in your own special way. Oh, Father, to become better vessels for your use. I surrender myself to you, Lord, that you will just use me to bring your word even beyond the areas of preparation for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Love, once more, welcome, welcome to the platform. 
And uh, today is what, March 26, 2023. It's the last Sunday of the month. The first quarter of the year is shelving out, and we thank God for that. Amen. Today we'll be talking on vessel for honor. Vessel for honor. Uh, last week, we asked the question, do you honor your commitments? And we mentioned during that uh, message that commitments speak a whole lot about the content of our character. So we must be mindful about making commitments. We also said that we should not casually agree to do something when we know that we'll casually walk away from it. And that we make commitments, only the ones that we know we'll be able to keep, those are the commitments that we should make. We're reminded that there is no small commitments for you to overlook. A commitment is a commitment. And we left by saying that we should search ourselves to clear up any broken commitments in our lives. And we hope that you know we took this seriously and are implementing what we learned last week. It is by so doing that we become transformed, that we become more and more like Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. So the word of God tells us, like we saw last week in Psalms 138 verse 2, the Amplified Classic Version says, I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness. I will worship toward your holy temple. When Moses, uh, when when um, Solomon, when Solomon built the temple, when he dedicated the temple, he prayed specifically that the children of Israel, when they pray, they should face that temple. And when they pray and face that temple, because the eyes of the Lord were on that temple that the Lord would hear their prayers. So they had a commitment to pray and face that temple. Beloved, that was the same prayer that we prayed when we raised the altar of equality, the altar of reconciliation and equality. So for those of us who have forgotten about that commitment, when you are praying, try to locate the direction of the altar and pray towards it too. In times where you feel like you've been put in a corner, we know that the Lord's eyes are on that place, are on this place, and the Lord will respond accordingly. Amen. So this was a commitment they had, that I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and for your truth and faithfulness. For you have exalted above all else your name and your word, and you have magnified your word above all your name. Amen. Beloved, this verse of scripture tells us that the Lord has such high regard for his word that he has placed certain restrictions around his word. Commitments call for restrictions. You would say, because I am committed to go to the gym at 9 a.m. on Saturday, I am restricted from making other engagements for 9 a.m. on Saturday. I have committed to fast with my team from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Thursday. And what does this do? It disallows me from eating during that time. So every commitment you make comes with a restriction because you want to honor your commitments. I have told her that I'll be there at noon. So I am bound to be there at noon. You do everything possible to be there at noon. These restrictions come because once you have given your words to do something at a given time, you cannot invest your resources to doing something else at that same time. Mm -hmm. People listen to what you say and people are watching to see what you will do. Everyone is watching to see how you do what you say you will do. They are watching to see if you mean what you say. People are watching because they want to know if they should drop down their guards when you are around or if they should watch their backs when you are around. Life is so much easier when one is in the company of the people that he can trust. 
Nobody likes to be stressed up because you are around them. So implicit in every listening, implicit in every observation, implicit in every interaction, there is a filtering of what is said, a filtering of what is seen, a filtering of the exchange that is experienced through a set of expectations that will cause the hearer or the observer to say, I agree with him or I agree with her. Whatever you say, just know that the other person inside of them, there is some filter that is filtering your interactions, the things you are saying. Because why? People like to be in a place where they, don't, they are not worried about watching their backs. Nobody wants to carry that additional weight with them. And the more you interact with people and they have, I, I agree with, I agree with, I agree with, the more they build trust. And the more you trust someone, the more you welcome him or her in your private space. The more you trust someone, the more you value, the more value you assign to meeting with them. The more you ask, I mean, the more value you assign to hearing from him or her, from seeing him or her. This person becomes someone who gets your attention, someone for, for you to honor with your attention. He or she becomes to you a vessel for honor. When your phone rings and you look at the caller ID, you see it's a telemarketer or sometimes unknown or sometimes campaign, you may not pick it up because you, you don't know that person. You have not invested any time in them. You don't know if you can be comfortable around them. But when you see a phone number that you recognize, you answer, you answer your call. And if you are busy, you try to send that person a message to communicate to them that you are not ignoring them. Uh, as soon as the possibility is uh, made available to you, you call them back. Why? Because they have become a person that you honor. They have become a vessel for honor. There's an inherent desire in humans to encounter and have relationships with vessels for honor. When we become a new creation, we become vessels for honor. Everything that God has created is perfect. Then our sinful nature comes in and corrupts it. But when we receive Christ as Lord and Savior, we become a new creation. We, we have a restoration of our vessels for honor. But unfortunately, some of us backtrack from that. We backtrack from that. So in today's message, we are going to keep it simple and just examine a few vessels for honor at home, at work, and in the body of Christ. So we can see how it plays in our own lives and see how we can cleanse ourselves to become the vessels for honor that the Lord has called us to be. Amen. Beloved, the first vessel for honor is a vessel for honor at home. And I would like us to look at Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Anybody can read for us? Let's participate here. Now, while they were on their way, it occurred that Jesus entered a certain village and a woman named Martha received and welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister named Mary who seated herself at the Lord's feet and was listening to his teaching. But Martha, overly occupied and too busy, was distracted with much serving. And she came up to him and said, Lord, is it nothing to you that my sister has left me to serve alone? 
tell her then to help me, to lend a hand and do her part along with me. But the Lord replied to her by saying, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. There is need of only one or but a few things. Mary has chosen the good portion, that which is to her advantage, which shall not be taken away from her. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Perdita. Beloved, we have seen this, read the story of Martha and Mary. We know that Martha was the um, sister of Mary and sister of Lazarus. They lived in a town called Bethany. And Bethany could be translated as house of figs or house of welcome. House of welcome. So Martha stuck with house of welcome and was hospitable to a fault. Now, it's better to be overly hospitable than to be an adulterer like David or a liar like Abraham or a murderer like Moses. So when we hear the story of Martha, we should not just, you know, narrow our focus on one aspect to her life. Every household needs a matter. Everybody needs a matter in their life. Amen. Amen. So we want to look at the matter aspect, which is that vessel for honor. Beloved, every household, like I said, could use a hospitable atmosphere. So let's, let's look at Martha's life in the context of how applicable it is to our lives today and not be quick to judge her. Martha had the great privilege of hosting our Lord Jesus Christ in her house. And like every great privilege, it came with great responsibility. Amen. Now, there is a joke that was told of a woman who had people over for dinner. And when everyone was seated at table, she asked her six-year-old son to pray and bless the food. And then the child said, mommy, I don't know what to pray. I don't know what to say. And the mother told him, just say what you hear mommy saying. Then the child said, okay, let's pray. He said, oh God, why did I invite all these people to dinner? Amen. So, you see, there is pressure to be a good host. Yes, we want everybody to come, but we get into that mode of, I want to, you know, clean the house, clean the bathrooms, make everything look nice and squeaky clean so that when people come, they're going to have a good time. It puts pressure on you. And for the most part, we are like this woman. If she did not invite all these people to come into her home, she would not be, you know, stressing up. She would not be stressing herself. So there is pressure to be a good host. And Martha was pulled away by what she had to do. She had some pressures to address. She was distracted by all her preparations. She was distracted from spending time with Jesus. Martha was distracted because she was doing all that was in her power to make sure that Jesus had a wonderful and welcome experience at her house. She might have been tidying his room and overhearing him as he taught the people who had come. She might have been cooking the favorite dishes that she knew that Jesus would enjoy and overhearing him in the living room as he taught the guests. She might have been getting some desserts ready and overhearing him. What Martha was doing is Martha must have been multitasking. When we blame Martha, we should ask ourselves, how often do we put earpieces in our ears and we are listening to a message or we are joined a prayer line and we are cleaning? We are half listening 
and thinking about the ingredients that we cook, we used to cook. Half listening and adjusting the air flows and the temperatures in the house to make sure that everyone is comfortable. You are half listening and making sure that there's enough water for Jesus and his disciples to wash their feet. Half listening and making sure that ants and bugs do not get on their food. Half listening and making sure that there was enough oil for the lambs that Jesus and his disciples will use that evening. Martha was doing all that good stuff. But it did distract her from something which our Lord Jesus Christ said was more valuable and which was spending time with Christ and giving Christ his full attention. Giving Christ her full attention, rather. But life is busy, and Martha could not afford the time. Does that sound familiar to us? Yes, it does. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. What Martha was doing was equally important, but it could have waited if she knew the significance of that moment. Christ was teaching in the last week of his earthly ministry, and Martha had the opportunity to sit at his feet, but missed it in favor of making sure that he had a great time at her house. Beloved, sometimes we miss what's important to Christ and dwell on what's important to us. I want everyone around us to get on board with what is important to us. We need to ask the Lord for discernment. For discernment. At a certain point, Martha interrupted Christ's session and asked that he sent Mary to help her. But Christ admonished her that Martha was stressing and worrying a little too much. Yeah, people do worry when guests come over. And most times, what people worry about never happens. One thing that this story teaches us is that worrying can cause us to place undue emphasis on the minor issues or the non-essentials. We need to bear that in mind. We also learn that it is important to give Christ our full attention. If all the messages you listen to are on the go, then you need to create time to listen to at least a message without distraction. We are busy, yes. But allocate those 15 minutes that for these 15 minutes, all I will do is listen intently at, at what this man of God or this woman of God is saying. On the go, you are like matter, listening and preparing the dishes. You know, some of us, we move from one prayer, prayer line to the next while at work. Your phone is there, you have your earpiece, you are working and doing everything. Then you tell yourself that you pray all the time. Yeah, that is better than listening to, you know, the crazy information that is out there, but it's not enough. You must look for one-on-one -on -one time to pray. No matter how short that time is, you want to do that. You know, another lesson we learn from this story is that we should be conscious to give our spouses and other people in our lives the opportunity to sit at the feet of Christ. You are not being a good spouse, you are not being a good friend, if you are the only one who attends all the seminars and the conferences and just have your, your spouse watch the kids or have your friends watch the kids or take care of other business, it's better to take turns. It's better to take turns, give everybody the opportunity to have that quiet time to be at the feet of the Father. Martha's story also teaches us that she did not ask Jesus to serve. She served. Looking for ways to serve is a good quality that we should emulate. It is what reiterating that we should not allow anything to distract us from spending one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus, even when we are good at service. 
Beloved, there's so much purposeful competition for our attention today than what was at Martha's time. A lot more competition for our time. So vessels for honor must look out for electronics, social media, the internet, your phone, you know, work, children, cooking, housework, pleasures, going out for dinners and all of those stuff. We need to look out for those things and find a balance, a balance to make sure that those don't become distraction. Yes, some distractions are a part of life. Like yesterday was a very challenging one for me. Because when I went to the altar just to pray and get myself ready before you know, looking at the message, just about five minutes into my prayer time, a little ones came with a phone for me to do FaceTime. I had to oblige. It's part of what you do as a parent. They could just come because they want to tell you something. You have to listen to them. That is where they are in life. You know, there are certain things that when they happen, because it's your family obligation, you just have to take it in stride as a vessel for honor. You don't get into a bad mood. You don't complain that they have disturbed me. I was getting in the flow of this and this person disturbed. No, 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 those things are not necessary. You just put them aside. You thank God for the blessing of children who will be a, a distraction to you at a time such as that one. Because we pray for children. We ask God, we ask God to bless us with marriage. We ask God to bless us with children. And when the children are born, they have to live their life. Amen. <laughs> so vessels of honor have to take distractions from children in stride and just give God thanks that it is happening. But from this, what we, what we should also remember in the story of Martha is that we should not distract anyone else from being at the feet of Jesus. Do not distract anyone else. Martha wanted Jesus to ask Mary to join her, but Jesus admonished her. So we must be careful not to become the stumbling block for others. Amen. Beloved, in the family, that's what we, I just want us to pay attention to, that we all have need for matters. And when we have a matter, we will not ride that willing horse to death, but also give that matter the opportunity to sit at the feet of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I want us to look at a vessel for honor at work. And for that, I would like us to look at 2 Samuel chapter 11 from verses 6 to 11. 2 Samuel 11, 6 to 11. While someone is preparing to read, I just want to, you know, preface about Uriah. With a name like Uriah the Hittite, I will not assume that everyone who will listen to this message will be familiar with Uriah. So I will attempt to give a little background before we read the text from 2 Samuel 11. He was a fierce warrior and an upstanding man. He was one of King David's mighty men who showed great loyalty and integrity to his king and the team. Uriah was off with the king's men and the army fighting against the Ammonites when King David recalled him from the war front. King David would have him drink into a drunken stupor and ask him to go home and be with his wife. Unbeknownst to Uriah, David had had an affair with his wife and she was pregnant and David wanted him to go home, to go home drunk and maybe sleep with his wife and assume that the pregnancy was by him. But Uriah didn't go home. So David would later cause Uriah to get killed at the battlefront, take his wife, and 
in his regrets and his lament and his apology, he wrote Psalm 51. Amen. So beloved, if anyone is ready, they could read for us the section of scripture that we want to read from 2 Samuel 11 from verses 6 to 11. Then David said to Joab, saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and did not go down to his house. So when they told David saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents and my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this. Amen. So we hear David's requests and Uriah's response. Uriah means God is my light. This suggests that although he was described as a Hittite, Uriah was a follower of Yahweh. He was a man concerned with honor. He was a trusted protege of the king, which explains why he did not live far away from the king's palace. Because what happened was the king was able to stand from his own balcony and see Uriah's wife as she was bathing during her period of cleansing as required by the, the, the laws of Moses. As we know, with presidencies, you don't just live close to a presidency unless you are one of the president's men. So if David could spot her from that distance, it meant that they live really close. But what we know is that Uriah was married to one wife, even though he was one of King David's uh, 30 elite men of valor. He was that close. He had the world. He could have been polygamous if he chose to, but he was an honorable man. And David knew that he was an honorable man, yet he pushed his cards to see if he would fall for that. And David's plan depended on Uriah not acting in honor. You have military men who have committed themselves to a life of abstinence during battles, during military campaigns like this. That's the commitment that they had amongst themselves. In 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 4 and 5, it tells us that David's men, men of valor, David's close men, had committed themselves to abstinence in times of war. They will not violate that for anything. But yet, David thought that he could push Uriah to do that. But Uriah was drunk and he had the king's permission to go to his house and sleep, but he would not break his commitment. If we look at it, no one was watching. But as an honorable man, he did not go. And what was the reason that he didn't go? He could not go because the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant was out in the field. Israel was out in the field. Judah was out in the field. They were staying in tents 
and Uriah's direct boss, his direct commander, jo Joah, and all the king's men, all the other who made up the petty elites, they were camped in open country, defending Israel against the Ammonites. So he did not see that he could go into his house to eat and drink and enjoy and stay with his wife when these things were happening. He's the kind of guy who would not let his team behind. He will not disappoint his team, whether his teammates were watching or not. We need that kind of person at work. We learn from this that there could be some people at our workplace who, although they could not look like you, or they could not belong to the same, you know, Christian faith like you, but they could be trusted confidence. So when you find someone with the right tool set for a position, feel free to give them a chance. Feel free to give them a chance. We learn from this story also that, I mean, as a Hittite, these are people who are historically antagonistic to Israelites, you know, but he, he was good to David. If not, he would not have been one of his, uh, uh, his elite 30. He was a man of honor and one of David's most trusted warriors. You know, do not shut the door at work, you know, to someone just because they are not, just because they are not a Christian. Do not, but you want to look at what other things, what other qualities that they bring. Uriah did all the right things, but what we learn from this story is that it is not by doing all the right things that you guarantee that everything will go well with you when you are dealing with human beings. He served David with passion and devotion. He was a faithful husband to one wife. Yes, the king who had many wives took his only wife and killed him. You know, so beloved, sometimes when we see someone suffering, we see someone suffering even to the point of death, we should not be quick to say this person is suffering because of their sin. There is nothing wrong that Uriah did here to deserve this kind of you know, treatment from the king that he so loved and was so dedicated to serving. But in this too, we learn that God did not abandon David. David was weak and broken and above all, he was repentant. And God allowed him to marry Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, and then have Solomon by Bathsheba. The Solomon who continued the lineage of King David and our Lord Jesus Christ came through that line. What the Father wants us to see is that doesn't matter what you have done in the past, when you repent, his arms are open wide to receive you. And his plans for you will not be disturbed because of what you did. He will be here to give you a second chance. We see that because of this act, the one thing God did not allow David to do was to build a temple for him. Because when you invest trust in someone and they trust you back, then you betray them. It's, it's I mean, it's one of the worst things that is recorded in scripture. This is like David acted like a Judas to Uriah. He trusted his, his master. He served him with all that he had in him. But David had blood in his hands and for that he could not build a temple. But what we know beloved is that a repentant heart 
a broken and a contrite heart is surely what got David back on track to be a vessel for honor. As it happened for David, it will happen for you too when you make that turn around. Amen. 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 Beloved, I would like us to look at you and I as vessels for honor at church. You and I as vessels for honor. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 to 21. Sister Christine, if you would read for us, as I saw the last time we we're going to read. Sure. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also utensils of wood and earthenware and some for honorable and noble use, and some for menial and ignoble use. So whoever cleanses himself from what is ignoble and unclean, who separates himself from contact with contamination and corrupting influences, will then himself be a vessel set apart and useful for honorable and noble purposes, consecrated and profitable to the master, fit and ready for any good work. Amen. Amen. Fit and ready for any good work. Fit and ready for any good work. That is the end game for all of us as children of God. We want to be prepared for every good work. We want to be consecrated, set apart, made fit and ready for every good work. The Apostle Paul talks of a great house, which is none other than the church of God. The church of, there's no greater house than the church of God. And why is that? It, it belongs to God. It belongs to God. The church is great because there's no limits to its size, its design, or its brilliance. The church of God is great because it took the cost of our Lord Jesus Christ's life to build it. There is no greater value. The church of God is great because it is a center of God's plan for all ages. It is indeed a great house. Amen. Mm -hmm. And we are the vessels of gold, silver, wood, and clay. Some are used for great honor. That's the silver and gold, of course, while the wood and the earthen you know, material, the clay, are used for dishonor. You must ask yourself, beloved, just like I'm asking myself, am I a vessel of honor in the house of God or am I a vessel of dishonor? Am I a golden platter that oozes out the fruit of the spirit? Or am I a garbage bin? Am I a trash bag? Am I an ash tray? But we want to remember also that Christ came for the garbage bins of the church. Christ came for the trash cans of the church. He came for the ash trees of the church. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 19, the word of God tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Christ will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Beloved, this is to the Christians. Christ will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, don't say, yeah, I've been in church, but I've been so bad, I just, there is no place for me. No. The word says, if you confess your sins, Christ is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He came for the garbage bins of the church. He came for the ash trees of the church. He came for those who will make mistakes. 
He did not come to condemn, but he came that we will have a second chance and live lives that will make us worthy vessels for every service. One thing we must realize is you cannot cleanse yourself. So you ask God and he will do it for you. Our role in this cleansing process is to trust in our Lord Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross. We have to trust that. We have to believe that it has everything that we need to be cleansed, to be reinstated, so that we can also serve as vessels of honor. Christ did not die for his own benefit, but he died for our benefit. And we must reach out to receive the full benefits that his dying on the cross gave to us. Your own will and effort are necessary. We cannot emphasize this anymore. It's necessary that you extend your hand to receive the benefits, to ask for forgiveness from the Lord. Your commitment to become a gold platter in the house of God will determine how you want to be used by God. You become a gold platter by staying at his house, beholding his beauty. You become a gold platter by hiding God's word in your heart so that you will not sin against him. You become a gold platter through your deliberate will and effort to renew your mind with the washing of water by the word. You become a gold platter when you are not conformed to the pattern of this world. No matter how many people stand on the other side, you say, no, I will not be conformed to the pattern of this world but you are transformed to the heavenly pattern after Christ our Lord. For the word of God tells us, as Christ is, so are we in this world. Beloved, we are all people who have been given second chances. The body of Christ is made up of all of us in the body of Christ are people who are benefiting from having received the second chance. We have received Christ as our Lord and Savior, and he has imputed his righteousness on us. That is how we become born again. That is how we are in the body of Christ. And this was not because we deserve it. It was because of God's love. For God demonstrated his love to us that while we were still sinners, he sent Christ to die for us. It is because of God's grace. It is because of his mercy. It's because of the finished work on the cross. And how you use your second chance is totally up to you. This is what determines whether you are a vessel for honor, such as gold and silver, or you are a vessel for dishonor, which is wood and clay. But beloved, I charge you all to become vessels for honor. Our God does not discriminate. So anyone who chooses to be a vessel for honor will be set apart, sanctified, and useful for every good work. Anyone who chooses to do that. Every good work tells us that you are needed exactly where you are. You are needed in the marketplace. You are needed in the administration, you are needed in the area of education, in the area of media, in the area of telecommunication, wherever you find yourself, you are needed right there for the good work that is necessary in that place. There are some of your colleagues or some of my colleagues who may never go to church, but you will become church to them until they have an encounter and now decide to look for a place of discipleship and worship. To become a vessel for honor, I enjoin you to follow in the way that the Apostle Paul spoke to his mentee, Timothy. And I'll conclude by what Apostle Paul said to his mentee, Timothy, as found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 through 26. Apostle Paul says, run away from childish indulgence. Run after mature righteousness, which is faith, love, peace. Joining those who are in honest 
and serious prayer before God. Refuse to get involved in in end discussions. They always end up in fights. God's servants must not be argumentative, but a gentle listener and a teacher who keeps cool, working firmly but patiently with those who refuse to obey. It says, you never know how or when God might sober them up with a change of heart and a turning to the truth enabling them to escape the devil's trap where they are caught and held captive, forced to run his errands. Beloved, when we see people running errands for the devil, we should not just judge them and put them in a box. They are traps. But we have to demonstrate the love of God towards them. We have to pray for them. We have to intercede for them. We have to stand as vessels of honor and demonstrate a lifestyle to them that they will cherish. And when they express that desire in their heart, the Holy Spirit will pull them from that place and bring them to a place where they will start focusing on the things of the Lord. Like we said, the Lord made us, the Lord is perfect in all that he has done. And we are his creation. That when he created, he looked at it and said, it is very good. Very good. Very good vessels for honor. We have received Christ. We are a new creation. We are vessels for honor. And let us go out and live up to that standard. May the Lord bless his holy word. Amen. 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 Thank you for your word. Thank you for this word that came in. Um, it's really a word indeed. Vessels for honor. Um, I will just let the word sink in my heart and while I ask myself, am I a vessel for honor? If I am, or if I am not, what areas do I believe I'm not a vessel for honor? I have to visit those areas. You could be a vessel for honor in this area and then not be in a vessel for honor in this area, you know? So it's just something that I would um, ask myself. Again, this is very powerful and impactful. And I'll just let it sink in while I, you know, search myself, my inner self. So thank you, Daddy K, for the word. I will um, open up the floor for any comments or feedbacks if you do have any. I'd like to read this last verse that you read again. As part of my uh, verses you read, as part of my feedback, in 2 Timothy 2, 22 to 26, the message translation always gets the message across. <laughs> it's run away from childish indulgence. Run after mature righteousness, which are faith, love, peace, Joining those who are in honest and serious prayer before God. Refuse to get involved in inane discussions. They always end up in fights. God's servants must not be argumentative, but a gentle listener and a teacher who keeps cool, working firmly, but patiently with those who refuse to obey. You never know how or when God might sober them up with a change of heart 
and a turning to the truth, enabling them to escape the devil's trap where they are caught and held captive, forced to run his errands. Amen. Amen. Thank you for reading that again, True. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other comment, feedback with regards to the word? Everyone is silent. I'm trusting that everybody is just letting it sink in. Amen. Drops the mic with that second reading. The way it was done was very necessary. Um, thank you for this word. I thank God that I believe I came on right <laughs> at his perfect timing uh, in the middle of trying to prepare brunch for my family <laughs> and hearing that you halfway listening and the distractions that you may unfortunately uh, face in life. So um, it just is timely and uh, something that makes you see things differently. Even though you think you're listening, it's not enough. It's not okay. So thank you. Praise okay. God. Amen. Thank you for sharing that, Sister Desiree. Amen. I just um, thank God for the, what's the word to use? The, um, caution and uh, rebuke when it comes to attending to many things while the message is going on because that's a that's a common thing especially how we do it on zoom and not in person so that can really happen a lot so when i heard that i was giving the kids a shower i was like oh, i want to leave soap on you guys and leave you here <laughs> i'm supposed to be there in the shower with soap on their body but i was like okay so i thank us for bringing that up today and the word today I took away everything, you know, sitting on it and digesting it. It was so powerful and so necessary and so timely. And I give God glory. Amen. God bless you, Pastor Kwame. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing that, Sister Ben Aspa. And indeed, you're right. Um, but that's why, again, we do have a second chance, right? for some of us who multitask in situations like this. Fortunately, we do have a recording that's gonna be uploaded. So we have the chance to go back in our quiet moments and then rewatch the whole thing with no distractions. Amen. Amen. Okay. If no, Additional comment or feedback. Again, I just want to seize this opportunity to thank you, Daddy K, for allowing yourself to be used by the Lord to bring such a powerful and impactful message. Um, may the good Lord continue to bless and replenish you in every area of your life. And um, I just encourage each and every one of us again that as we depart from here, let's really let the message sink in and ask ourselves, are we verses for honor? If we are not in any area, we know what to do. Amen. Amen. I want to invite Daddy K again to just pray for us and close us out. We pray for us, man. Amen. Thank God for the opportunity to pray for this message. Thank you, Daddy. Amen. Um, Amen. For um, passing through you to release his word to us. And I believe that the words that we have received have fallen on fertile ground. And will yield a hundredfold return in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you because your word came today for the purpose of transformation. That truly we have all encountered your word this day, Lord. 
and none of us are we leave this place the same. That we have received will transform us and then we will use it as well to sow in the lives of others so that they too can be transformed in the name of Jesus. Amen. Daddy, for teaching us that we are indeed vessels for honor mm -hmm. and that this can be exercised in a family setting in um, a work setting father and in your house mm -hmm. father we thank you for teaching us using the life of Martha that we should not be quick to judge however we should be quick to understand the scenario and the situations that people are undergoing and why they do what they do in Martha's case, she wanted to be grateful for honor towards the Lord Jesus Christ himself, towards you, Father. And she decided to go overboard with her preparations and also to show hospitality towards Jesus Christ. Okay. But Father, while we do all of these things, Father, you desire that we, we strike a balance, how we care for our families and the attention that we give to you. So the one major thing that we have received from this word is that one-on-one -on -one time with you is very important. We can listen to you on the go because your word tells us that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And you are an ever-present help in times of trouble. So there is no time that we are out of your presence because you're omnipresent. Mm -hmm. So therefore, Father, we shouldn't abuse those characteristics of yours by not setting aside time, one-on-one -on -one time with you to receive that which you have in store for us. Therefore, Father, we repent in this area and we receive your forgiveness and we choose to implement according to your word, which was received today. Father, even at our job site, we choose to show um, commitments in the things, in the responsibilities that you've given us in the name of Jesus. May we emulate the lifestyle of Uriah the Hittite. Mm -hmm. And Father, do not be like his master David, mm -hmm. who betrayed the commitment of his mm -hmm. servants in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Amen. Father, even while at work, we should not only think that only the children of God can be committed. May we look beyond that and begin to entrust responsibilities to other people who are not in the covenant Perchance we can use that means to share the gospel with them and make them even more committed in the things that they do at their jobs in the name of Jesus. Amen. We say thank you for teaching us that it is very important that in this great house that we become <clears throat> vessels of honor by being a vessel of gold and silver, not of wood and clay in the name of Jesus. Amen. So therefore, Amen. Father, because you have shown us through scripture what it takes to be a vessel of gold and what it takes to be a vessel of silver, Father. I pray that beginning today, we, we, we will submit ourselves to the cleansing by the blood of Jesus Christ so that we can be, we can be enabled to, to offer services to you um, in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Father, we want to conclude this particular session by thanking you for your reading in the word that we just received from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 to 26. And as I read this, I read this as a prayer unto you on our behalf in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Run away from childish indulgence, beloved. Mm -hmm. Run after mature righteousness, beloved, mm -hmm. which are faith, love, peace. May this be the things that we run after in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. May we not live in isolation for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. May we join those who are in honest and serious prayer before you. Mm -hmm. May we not think we can mm -hmm. do this do life in the kingdom by ourselves. Mm -hmm. God cannot do life by himself. That is why he sent Jesus Christ to come and mend a relationship with us back to him so that we can do life together. Beloved Father, the, the Father cannot do life on his own. What makes us think that we can do life by ourselves? May we refuse to get involved in inane discussions, discussions that profit us nothing, discussions that are not kingdom. We not get involved in inane discussions. Mm -hmm. They always end up in fights. 
How exemplary can we be when we end up in fights daily? It is not profiting to us. So may we shun from those lifestyles in the name of Jesus. We are all God's servants. And the Bible is admonishing us today that God's servants must not be argumentative. God's servants, everyone on this line is a servant of God. May being an argumentative person not be part of a resume in the kingdom. In the name of Jesus. Jesus, but amen to listeners for the glory of God. Amen. As people who have been commissioned with a great commission, we are all teachers. Amen. Therefore, he's calling on all of us on this platform to be teachers who keep cool, yes. yet working firmly, yes. but um, patiently with those who refuse to obey. Amen. Do not get weak in, in, in your commitment, in preaching the gospel firmly by standing against sin, walk firmly yet be faithful with those who refuse to obey the word of the gospel, the word of the, the kingdom in the name of Jesus. Amen. Why? Because you never know how and when God might sober them up with a change of heart. Therefore, I decree that may we not grow weary in well-doing in the name of Jesus. Amen. And Amen. The the truth, enabling them to escape the devil's trap. Mm -hmm. If you are not for the Lord, you're for the devil. If you're not trapped by righteousness, you're trapped by sin. And may that not be our portion in the name of Jesus, mm -hmm. where we are caught and held captive, forced to run his errands. I decree and I declare today that we will not run the errands for the enemy beginning today in the name of Jesus, Amen. because we have not been bought uh, by the blood of Jesus and cleansed by the blood of Jesus to run errands for the devil, to stay in the enemy's trap. I decree and I declare this day that we are all coming out of bondage and captivity. You may have come out of bondage, but you're still in captivity. I therefore decree a total release now in the name of Jesus. Amen. That you're bound and you're no longer held in captivity mm. because even the captives can be set free mm. in the name of Jesus. Mm. I decree and I declare that the blood of Jesus Christ has ha has wiped away every handwriting of requirements against you. The handwriting mm. of requirements of bondage mm. have been wiped in the name of Jesus. Amen. Mm. Handwriting of requirements of captivity have been wiped in the name of Jesus. Mm. I therefore declare the forward movement beginning now by virtue of this message at least in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I decree that we are coming out, we're evolving to new people on the other side in the name of Jesus, Amen. that we are no longer trapped. Amen. Thank you, Father, for Thank indeed we are vessels for honor Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 May we share the grace, please. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide now forever. Surely His goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and lives, and we will dwell well in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. 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 Thank you, all family.